Um, let's see, I'm not seeing my. Okay. All right, in one minute, I'm gonna figure out my, my mail. And I just got a flurry of phone calls while we're doing this. Always. I just got a whole <laughs> flurry of like panicked emails about something for grad studies. And I'm just like, okay, I have to put this aside for a while and no. not worry about it. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. Am I sharing? I don't know. Okay. Let me know if you can see my screen. Yes. It's a Google screen. Okay. okay. Um, let me see. I wanted to, before I introduce our guests, so I want to welcome everyone. I am Michelle Hamilton. I am the director for the Center for Medieval Studies, and we are delighted to have Christina Sesso with us. I do want to announce that we have one more talk in our um, lecture series, and it will be Anatoly Lieberman's talk on December 3rd. So please join us uh, for that. It's uh, a Thursday talk at four. Um, and Anatoly has agreed to come with us into this new reality on Zoom. So we're looking forward to that. Um, but today you are all here to hear uh, Professor Christina Sessa from the Ohio State University. She is a associate professor um, in the Department of History and she has her PhD in Ancient and Medieval History from the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, her research focuses on the history of late antique religions and society, especially on the intersection between classical Roman culture and early Christianity in the late Roman West. Um, she is the author of um, two books, um, The Formation of Papal Authority in Late Antique Italy, Roman Bishops in the Domestic Sphere, out with Cambridge in 2012. And um, her book from 2018, Daily Life in Late Antiquity, also out with uh, Cambridge. Um, I also saw you have a 2019 article on the new environmental fall of Rome, which sounds like it could be related to your project that you're working on, um, on disaster in late antiquity, cultural and material history. Um, and I, oh, I also want to mention that you will be participating in a workshop, so you're also um, welcome to um, continue, hopefully continue part of this conversation, have, you know, a different conversation um, related to late antiquity and religion with uh, Professor Sessa um, tomorrow. Um, and today you're here to hear the talk on the Justinianic plague and the end of antiquity, recent research and new directions. Again, related, it sounds like, to this project <laughs> on disaster in late antiquity. So with that, I'll, in, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Excellent. Okay, now I'm going to do the thing where I share my screen. So just give me a second here. Um, okay. Why is that? Um, why is it not move? Oh, here we go. Okay. Voila. Okay, wonderful. I'm hoping. Great. So first of all, thank you. Thank you, Michelle uh, Hamilton. Thank you, Lauren uh, Cowdery, the Center for Medieval Studies for inviting me. And thank you, uh, Andrea Sturk, who was the one who actually asked me to do this. And Andrea had written to me a couple of months, several months ago and asked me if I would be willing to, oops, let me go, I'm not where I should be, hold on. Um, sorry, um, I'll get there in a second. Um, asked me if I would come talk about the Justinianic plague and I said, absolutely, I'm excited to do this, but I wanted to start with just what I hope won't sound like a lame disclaimer, but I wanna be clear, uh, what I do, what I am an expert in and what I am not. <laughs> I am a social and cultural historian of late antiquity. Um, what I am not is an, a historian of medicine, an historian of infectious disease, and I am definitely not a paleogeneticist. Um, and the material that I'll present to you today, it really represents my own synthesis, which I, I hope is correct, of some of this scientific work, along with a lot of the um, scholarship produced by historians on the Justinianic plague. And where I, I see my interventions um, 
I don't have critiques of the science per se, unsurprisingly, but where I do see my intervention is particularly on questions of method and specifically on how it is we think we can integrate historical and scientific data and methods. So starting off now, I'm, I'm going to start off just to talk a little bit about the disease itself. And then I want to talk about the historiography. And plague, so what is the plague? And I'm sure many of you know the answer to this, but plague is the generic English term uh, for an infection of Yersinia pestis bacteria. And the, the, the bacteria can infect a number of different mammals, including humans. And it comes in three different forms. And just to be clear, this is all the same disease and genetically. What's different is the pathway uh, through the body, the disease kind of follows. Um, the, the, if, the, if the disease enters and goes through the lymphatic system, that's known as bubonic plague. Um, and it results in that telltale sign of the swollen lymph nodes, which you can see from the image on the right. That's somebody who has bubonic plague. Um, there are two other ways that the, the disease can kind of make its way through your system. One is through the circulatory system and that's the septicemic plague. And then the other is through the respiratory system, which is known as pneumonic plague. Um, just to be clear, the septicemic and pneumonic forms are, are incredibly fatal. You almost always die if you get those, um, obviously without antibiotics. If you were to contract the and manifest through the bubonic form, it's, it is slightly less fatal. Um, something like between uh, 20 to 40 percent of the people who got it, and this of course is before there's antibiotics, but something like 20 to 40 percent of the people who got it would survive. And in fact, we know about a number of quite famous survivors of plague in late antiquity, like the Emperor Justinian. Um, the other kind of small point to make is that when our late antique and early medieval sources are clear and explicit that they are talking about um, a Yersinia pestis infection, obviously they didn't have that vocabulary. They, they all seem to be talking about the bubonic form because they talk about swollen areas in the groin and under the arms, which is clearly these lymph nodes. So we can probably sort of assume that the bubonic form was the dominant primary form of the infection that most people had in, in late antiquity. Okay, so why do we call it the Justinianic plague? Well, we call it the Justinianic plague because the initial outbreak in the Roman Empire and our first written sources about that outbreak um, correspond with the reign of the Emperor Justinian, who is the image, well, his image of Ravenna is on your, your left. Um, I do wanna say that there is an alternative nomenclature that's often used. Um, and, and in this nomenclature, rather than sort of giving these kind of historical terms like Justinianic plague, Black Death, they break it down, the, they break down the, the, the plague actually into three different pandemics um, as a way to kind of signal that we're talking about the same disease um, recurring in, you know, on a mass world scale, um, um, you know, on, on a large, to, to, a, to a large geographic extent. Um, and so under this alternative nomenclature, we talk about the first pandemic, which is the Justinianic plague, exactly the same thing. We then talk about a second pandemic, which as you can see, includes what we call the Black Death, but actually also includes later um, pandemics in, through the 18th century. And then there's this third pandemic, which um, took place in the later 19th and 20th centuries. And this third pandemic was largely focused on Asia, on China and India, and it killed something like 10 or 12 million people. And it's interesting because th this is the, the, the pandemic that most, the, the sort of outbreak of bubonic plague that most people haven't heard of, but actually it's probably the most important when it comes to the study um, of the science of the disease, because it's during that third pandemic that, um, well, it was during this period that the, the whole science of epidemiology and microbiology was kind of forming. And it was during the third pandemic that a scientist named Alexandre uh, Gersin identified the pathogen in, you know, in, to which his name is now given to, to the bacterium. Um, but the third pandemic is actually like kind of crucial for starting to understand what the disease was on a microbiological level. Um, so I will, I will leave at it that. Um, 
even though the, we talk about the first pandemic and we call it the first pandemic, I wanted to, to be clear that in fact, 541 is not the first time that bubonic plague or Yersinia pestis infection uh, happened in, in Eurasia. We know through genomic evidence that there were a number of outbreaks during the Bronze and even Neolithic ages. So it's important to kind of remember that in many ways, plague has been around for a long time. It's not some kind of, um, you know, outside disease that sort of all, once, you know, every couple millennia kind of sneaks into Europe and sneaks out again. I mean, it's been part of Eurasia for, for thousands and thousands of years. Okay, um, I'm, I'm pretty certain that everyone has some familiarity with the plague cycles and pathways, how you get plague. Um, and the, the key sort of um, non-human agent is the flea, right? And the flea is what is our key vector. So the flea carries the bacteria in its gut quite happily. It doesn't bother the flea. Um, the flea will then, you know, feed on a mammal. And in the process of feeding on the mammal, will regurgitate into the mammal. And that's how the bacteria gets passed from the flea to the mammal. Now, some mammals actually do perfectly well with the bacteria, like marmots, for example. And they can, you can have these, these so-called uh, rodent reservoirs. I love that phrase. It's just so, I don't know, it makes me think of all sorts of like awful things. But in fact, the rodent reservoir isn't a bad thing because these the rodent reservoir is basically kind of a stable um, ecosystem in which the plague will live. Um, and live quite, you know, happily without killing uh, lots of people or animals for that matter. But at some point, the, the, a flea from this rodent reservoir of mammals that can kind of tolerate it, it jumps onto a mammal that can't. And classically, we thought that was the rat, right? We thought that was the rat that was moving from this one rodent reservoir into the human population. And, and studies of the Black Death, for example, have focused you know, intensely on the Black Rat, Tratus Tratus. Um, and I should say, the reason why we look for rats for um, as a kind of key uh, you know, additional sort of vector is because in the third pandemic, it clearly was rats that were moving it around. Um, the problem that those of us who study the first and, and even the second pandemic have kind of had to face is that we don't have a lot of archeological evidence for dead rats. Um, and this has posed all sorts of questions like, well, maybe it wasn't rats after all. And there have been some interesting new studies that suggest it was, it was you know, ectoparasites like fleas and possibly even lice could have carried it from person to person. So you were probably more likely in the Justinianic plague to have got the plague from like your husband, from the flea off your husband, than from the flea off the rat that somehow, you know, you know, sort of snuck into your house from the grain ship, which was again, the kind of classic kind of cycle that we always thought. Um, in terms of where this comes from, Actually, late ancient sources were fascinated by this question. They were all wanted to kind of give their two cents where they thought the plague came from. Um, and some of the, for example, Evagrius of Antioch, who was a sixth century um, Greek speaking and writing uh, um, bishop who wrote in a, in a church history that has an account of the plague, he thought it, it, it came from Africa, from Ethiopia. Um, and the map on the right sort of shows you some of the theories. Um, Procopius, who is effectively his contemporary, another Greek writer um, and historian, thought it came from Pelusium, uh, which is, you can see it on, I can sort of show you here, it's this little port on the Red Sea. Um, scholars have actually thought it comes from Central Asia and it, it passed into the, the Roman Empire through some kind of trade route. Um, but interestingly, the most recent uh, genetic research that came out in 2019 that I'll talk about in a minute um, was said that that was actually inconclusive. They did not see in terms of the genetic signature of what they're finding to think it actually did come from Central Asia. So we're back to kind of square one. We actually don't necessarily really know where it came from. Okay, so with no, with, since you know, I've covered some stuff about the disease, and obviously there's way more to talk about, but I wanted to switch gears at this point and, and talk about what the plague meant 
and, and what scholars think the plague meant, and specifically to address a question that um, comes up quite a bit in my field, which is, did plague help end the Roman Empire? Um, and the argument goes something like this. The plague caused catastrophic demographic decline. Anywhere between 30 and 60% of the total Roman population, which just is a kind of little, um, oops, I don't know why it did that. Um, just as a tiny, just as a little aside, um, to be honest with you, we don't really know what the total Roman population was at any time. Um, when anyone gives you a number, like a little red light should go off because actually we have no idea. Um, it's estimated to be somewhere between, you know, I see everything from 30 to 50 million for the entire empire in the sixth century. Uh, I would guess, I would probably guess if I had to guess on the lower end of that than the higher. Um, so, so the argument goes that the plague killed something like 15 or 20 million people um, out of this larger population. And that because of this sort of catastrophic demographic die off, you then have a whole set of knockoff effects that you have economic collapse, you have political collapse. You also, in some cases, have cultural changes. People often talk about the rise of apocalypticism. Um, <laughs> people become more religious. They, they turn to the church, they turn to the monasteries because of the, these enormous kind of catastrophic die off that's going on. Um, in other words, they argue that plague helped end classical antiquity and start the Middle Ages. It's the kind of, it's the sort of rupture that, that happens. And this is very key to a lot of the ways in which historians have periodized this whole first millennium. Um, and the sixth century, that second half of the sixth century is key. It's seen as this kind of tipping point. Um, and I, you know, I'm as guilty of this as anybody, but I often sort of think about my, you know, my work ending at 600 um, as, a, as a late Romanist. And, and I think part of the reason why I've always thought that is because I've sort of internalized this idea that the plague had this, you know, contributed, was a, was a major contributing factor to the end of Rome. Um, and this idea that it's an argument that I just sketched from you, you can find you know, all over the place, but it's still very much alive. And so I wanted to just draw attention to the most recent um, iteration of this particular kind of form of Rome's fall, that is this environmental fall, um, which is to call attention to Kyle Harper's 2017 book. And as you can see from this passage that I, I pull out, he, he argues that the quote, twin catastrophes of plague and ice age, and here he's referring to what scholars call the, the late antique little ice age, that these didn't, you know, in one moment, snuff Rome out, but that they contributed to this, the, the environmental degradation and vitality. Um, in the long run, the forces of dissolution prevailed. And they, they he again, he he focuses on the second half of the sixth century as what he calls a tipping point, that this is this key kind of moment. Um, and so this is in many ways, this is probably the most, um, you know, one of the most accessible and interesting um, sort of iterations of this narrative, but it's not the only one. There's actually quite a bit of scholarship on the Justinianic plague that makes the argument that I just sketched for you. And, and we might want to think about the whole sort of field as, as being broken down into sort of two camps. Um, there are those who are the maximalists, and then there are those who are the minimalists. Um, and the maximalist, that, that position, which is the, you know, the one I sketched for you, um, really goes back largely to the work of two Annals scholar, uh, Berlin and Le Goff, who wrote the first two sort of environmentally um, uh, sort of interested, um, focused, I should say, um, study of the plague. Um, oh, oh, you know what I'm forgetting? I have, um, and I will upload this when I finish. I actually have a bibliography for everybody. Um, but I will, um, once I get through this, I will upload this into the chat. So you can all have a, all of these sources to, to look at. Sorry about that. Um, so this begins as a kind of annals project, but then it, in, in which you look at all the sources and you collected them as they did. And, and they very much supposed a, this kind of enormous demographic impact. 
And from there, you see there were lots of other authors who kind of built on that idea, um, leading all the way up to, to the work of Harper. Um, the, the minimalists, as I'm calling them, and I'm not the only one who calls them this, but this is, a, I think, a good way of thinking about it. Um, their, their sort of position is this kind of pushback against this idea that the plague had this catastrophic impacts, that it somehow killed off 30 to 60% of the population and, and you know, catalyzed all these enormous sort of structural changes. Um, and that position really, in some ways, goes back to an article that Jean Derliot wrote in 1989, where he looked at all of the epigraphic evidence from the second half of the sixth century and couldn't find very much. In fact, he could only find two inscriptions of, out of the hundreds that are extant that had any reference whatsoever to the plague. And he sort of threw up the question, well, you know, if it was this cataclysmic event, surely we'd have a little more, you know, epigraphic evidence. Um, and then there were other folks who kind of built on that or, or sort of investigated these questions in their own ways. And I would say the kind of um, most recent work by historians um, that's really systematically gone through all the evidence that, there, that, that has ever been used to argue for the maximalist position. This is the studies by Mordecai and Eisenberg and Mordecai um, et al. And again, I have them in the bibliography. I do want to sort of draw out one really important thing that happened. Um, while the historians were making all these arguments, you know, was it, was it a, a collapse or wasn't it? Um, there were some really important paleogenetic breakthroughs. And these start in the late, kind of the first work that's published was in 1998 um, by Michel um, Joncourt, which was, um, which was, which was dis disputed and just kind of discounted because of sort of issues of contamination. However, there have been further work done more recently that has definitively shown um, through analysis of dental pulp from human remains, they've been able to extract the dental pulp from human remains. And from that dental pulp, they've been able to both isol uh, to isolate, identify, and actually reconstruct the genome of Yersinia pestis. So they have these, these scientists have developed um, um, methods and protocols that has really shown without a shadow of a doubt that when our sources are describing this horrendous disease, they are describing most likely bubonic plague or, or some form of Yersinia pestis infection. Because we know now that Yersinia pestis infection was around in, in the Roman Empire. Um, and just to give you a sense of the um, sort of geographic spread here and what we have and what we don't have. This is from the most recent study by the scientists, the, scienti the scientific, uh, the paleogenetic team uh, that's led by Marcel Keller. Um, and what you have in front of you here is a, a map that does a couple of different things. Um, First of all, all of the shaded areas and the black circles, these are actually the circles refer to cities. These are all um, areas for which they argue we have sound historical evidence of plague. I would push back in some of those cases, but, but that's at least what denotes in the map. The, um, the, the squares, the yellow and pink squares, these are places that these are places on the map that mark cemeteries where the scientists have found bodies with plague. Um, if you look on the, the section B, which is on the, the right side, you'll notice there are some black squares and black triangles. Those are cemeteries where testing was done on bodies, but, but no plague was found, no Yersinia pestis was found. So they have had negative results, like that's important too. Um, but this gives you a sense, and the, the 2019 study, which is all of the places in yellow, this, this kind of brought us a whole new set of evidence for plague in the western part of the empire. And as you can see, they found plague in a body uh, almost or probably dating to the sixth century um, in England, in, in Britain, in, in Cambridge, <laughs> so, which is kind of amazing. Um, and so this, this hopefully gives you a sense of, of at least the, the geographic spread of the written historical and archeological evidence along with the genomic evidence. Okay, so 
there are, I want to talk a little bit in, in for the next couple of minutes about the historical sources and, um, you know, what they are and, and what they can tell us, and in many cases, what they can't tell us. Um, so, and just to be clear, I, if you're interested in two good uh, studies that really um, collects all of the, the written historical sources, um, Stathakopoulos 2004 and Mordecai and Eisenberg 2019 do this. And again, I will have the bibliography for everybody. So in terms of the, the written sources, we really have two main forms. We have literary narratives. Um, and in some cases, these are really extensive. We have um, descriptions by people like Procopius, John of Ephesus, Evagrius, Gregory of Tours of the disease itself, the, the symptoms, the course it takes, um, as well as in, in many of these cases, um, some kind of presentation of the social and impact of, of the disease on a community. They are particularly Procopius and John of Ephesus are really interested in how the, the plague in a specific place, um, Constantinople, they both talk about how it disrupts daily life. And so one of the kind of, one of the sort of parallel points they both make is that there, it disrupts uh, normal uh, sort of um, habits of burial. And that you have, um, because you have a kind of, you know, huge number of bodies, the the city's normal rhythms for handling the dead become disrupted, and you have to look to other means of dealing with the bodies. And and they both make that point quite stunningly. And in John of Ephesus's case, it's really graphic. I mean, he talks about these like liquefying bodies, sort of rotting on the streets and things like that. Procopius isn't, of course, this isn't as graphic, but. Um, but it's interesting. So we have that kind of material. We also have chronicles that in a much more compressed manner make references to what could be the, the plague. And I'd say what could be because I think in some cases here we tend to make assumptions perhaps a little too quickly um, that, you know, in terms of what it is exactly they're talking about. Um, and that brings me to the point I wanted to make next, which was just to kind of remind everyone if, if you don't know any if you don't know already about the language of play which is actually really vague um unlike in modern medical parlance which is funny because it's all these latin and greek words latin and greek actually don't have a lot of precise words for diseases um they tend to have general words for like a huge epidemic um, and, and then we'll qualify those words in a way. Greek's more definitely more precise than Latin. There are a lot more compound words in Greek than in Latin. Um, but for example, in Latin, terms like pestis, lues, morbus, this, these are words that could mean the plague, but they could also refer to any kind of widespread epidemic um, or even just even a localized outbreak of, of a particular disease. Um, when we're lucky, our sources qualify these terms with words like inguen or inguinaria, which refers to the, um, the groin area. And when they, they qualify it like that, we can, we can sort of you know, deduce with some a certainty that they're talking about specifically the bubonic form of the plague. Similarly, in Greek, loimos and, and nausos are words for disease, really. Um, but when they're qualified with bubo, which refers to the groin again, you get a little bit more specific. Um, I spent a lot of time with the Latin stuff more than I have with the Greek, although I, I need to go there. And I will say the other interesting thing that I've noticed is that in many, many cases, when ancient authors are talking about plague, they actually don't use terms like pestis and lues. They use these other words that connote something more general like ruin and destruction or disaster, we might say. Um, so words like clades, strages, plaga, and mortalitas can be used just as often um, to, to connote some kind of major disease event. And again, it's hard to know what exactly they're, they're getting at because that precision, which really only comes about, I don't know, in the 19th century, um, just simply doesn't exist. It's just, they're not interested in that, in trying to specify exactly what the disease is because they don't, they don't experience the disease as some kind of microorganism.
Um, and just to give you an example, this is what um, this is from the Chronicle of Marcellinus Comes, who is a sixth century um, person. So he's alive during this time. And he, this is, this is the evidence we have for plague in the West in the early, in the 540s, other than Gregory the Great, by the way, this is largely what we have. Um, and he refers to a great pestilence, a, and the term he uses though, that's Brian Koch's translation. The actual term is mortalitas magna. It probably is, but I just wanted to point out that the language itself has to, you have to really interrogate the language, I think more than scholars do. Um, and I'm, and again, I'm not going to spend any more time on this, but this is a, Gregory is a great example of how one can qualify. So here he talks about, you know, the, the pestilence, which they, you know, that pestilence, which they call in Guanaria. Like, so that's how he's sort of qualifying it. And we can pretty clearly know he's talking about bubonic plague in that case. Okay. Um, a little bit now about the other types of historical sources that we use, um, specifically the material historical sources, inscriptions and archaeological evidence. I've already mentioned that we actually only have two inscriptions <laughs> that refer specifically to the plague. They're both from the East. Um, and, and so we really don't have very much epigraphic evidence. Now, you might argue, well, isn't that a sign that everyone's dead? Maybe, but the epigraphic habit had been declining for a very long time, and there really isn't any evidence as Mordecai and, and his colleagues show that there's a kind of rapid fall off in the middle of the sixth century. It's just simply not true. So the inscriptions don't really get us anywhere. The archeology span is, is also really complicated. Um, it's not as straightforward as you might think. We do not have any plague cemeteries for the Justinianic plague like you do for the Black Death. You just don't have them. And for later, out, in later second pandemic outbreaks. Um, we, 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 and in fact, when we have burials that have, um, that are intact, we often, in the, one of the, for example, in, in um, Bavaria, where we have, you know, some of the work that was done by the geneticists, the cemeteries they work on, a number of the tombs where they have found bodies with plague genes also had burial goods. And this, this suggests, right, that those people were not buried haphazardly in a rush, they were buried carefully and, and with intention. Um, so that also kind of throws up some questions about, you know, whether or not when plague did come to this Bavarian town, did it wipe everybody out? Um, and it's also interesting because it does kind of sort of contradict what Procopius and John of Ephesus tell us is happening in Constantinople. And I don't, I'm not suggesting that they're making, I, I it probably in larger cities, it was more of a problem. Um, but it's interesting just to kind of throw that out. Um, Michael McCormick, I should say, has done heroic work in collecting references to what he calls mass burials. And this has been something he's been trying to do for a while as part of this whole um, push to do more genetic testing. Um, and he has a, a big survey in the, that came out in the Journal of uh, Roman Archaeology uh, over two years. But of all the graves that he looked at, he could only find 36. And there are, there are thousands of graves from this from in the sixth and seventh century. He could only find 36 that, um, that counted as in his mind as mass graves. And in, by the way, a mass grave for Michael McCormick is four or five bodies. It is not dozens. So again, keeping this in mind, it's our, our evidence does not sort of point to, um, at least today, it doesn't point to mass burials um, in the way that I would think of a mass burial. Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about some of the other arguments that scholars sometimes make about the archaeology. And I'm and I'm I'm not trying to be sort of like you know flip here, but there is a way in which archaeologists whom I otherwise super respect and think their work is amazing seem to sometimes get sucked into this, I, you know, the cor that correlation implies causation. And, and to give you an example, um, Hugh Kennedy in a study in 2007 argued that a that the um, that the um, the decrease in the number of settlements 
in Syria uh, begins in the middle of the sixth century. That, that, you know, book, and he argues that before the sixth century, there was expansion of settlement, or before the mid sixth century, there was expansion of settlements in Syria. And then after the mid sixth century, that expansion starts to stop. And, and he identifies this process um, which quite frankly, we see all over the Roman Empire in the sixth century. Um, and Syria is probably one of the better stories of, um, of you know, the, the slow abandonment of sites, as well as people making different choices about building, no longer building these big monumental structures, but um, public structures. And, and when they do build new things, they build churches. Um, and so for, for Kennedy, what he argued is that this happens in Syria in the, in, from the second half of the sixth century on because of the plague. Um, and, you know, and he writes, the, the archaeology is entirely consistent with the pandemic that caused a massive loss of life on repeated occasions. Um, but it doesn't. I mean, the, the, the archaeology doesn't say this. What the archaeology gives us is a process it doesn't give us an event, right? Um, and then he goes on, which I thought was the strangest thing. And he says, it does not prove positively that this was the case, but it does not provide any evidence against this. So, you know, I mean, to me, this sounds like arguments for like, you know, fraud in election. Like, well, we don't have evidence that it did do it, but, but we don't have any evidence that it didn't happen either. So therefore, you know, so again, it's this, it's this kind of way in which we historians and archaeologists, really good ones, get sort of sucked into this idea that the Justinianic plague had to have been some kind of catastrophic catalyst that, that must have caused this die off. And therefore, we can use it as um, an explanatory, of this, a kind of an explanation for all sorts of other things that are happening in late antiquity that in most cases have nothing to do with plague. And so that's just one example of the kind of, you know, I think problematic thinking that goes on in some of the work by archaeologists. Um, and by the way, there are lots of archaeologists who don't do this, but I have noticed, in, I know mostly the, the Italian evidence and, you know, every single time they have a settlement that seems to be abandoned sometime in the second half of the sixth century, I, so often they say, well, must have been, must have been the plague. <laughs> I mean, and, and we just, it's just ridiculous. We have no idea why this, this, this settlement was abandoned and it probably wasn't abandoned in like 10 years, right? And so in any event, that's just um, something to also keep in mind. Um, another piece of evidence that I wanna throw out before I sort of just tie up a few things um, is we also know that um, there are, sort of, as we might say, positive indicators that, that things continued normally throughout the sixth century that really do cut down this idea that plague was this catastrophic event. Um, and so here I've pulled a slide from the study by Mordecai et al, 2019. Um, sorry, let me go back. I don't know why it's doing that. Um, here, what you're looking at is they have used palynological evidence, so pollen evidence, fossilized pollen, um, and specifically here from cereal, uh, some sort of wheat, oats, stuff like that. And what you're looking at is the, the graphing of this pollen that's been, that's been found by archeologists doing in excavations, um, sort of mapped out over time. And as you can see, there is no massive break in the middle of the sixth century. Those regions that show were, were already sort of shifting away from cereal production, that's been going on for a long time. And in many cases, there really was no break, no rupture in the middle of the sixth century. And I should say, I'm sure you all know this, that um, you know, the pollen is the proxy for the, the agricultural production, but of course the agricultural production is the proxy for the economy, right? I mean, so really everything that we know about the, or much of what we know about the late Roman economy is tied to agriculture. And so what we might say is that this graph suggests that at least in the Eastern Mediterranean, um, there's not some sort of economic collapse. Again, if we use food production as a, as a proxy for that. Okay, um, I'll end with this last uh, slide. And let me just um, sort of say a couple of things, like what we still don't have. 
Um, we don't have high resolution death records. We don't have parish records and, and certainly nothing like this in large numbers. Um, we do get names occasionally from some of our historians, um, but we don't get a lot of names. We, we, and we, I have to say, I don't think we'll ever have that. I think this is the kind of record that's just never gonna show up. And, and if, if it was there, we would already have it. Um, we also don't yet have plague cemeteries, as I said before. Maybe we will find them, but we don't have them yet. Um, we also, and this is sort of my last big methodological point I wanna make, we don't have sizable samples of known plague victims. So I'm an historian, right? What I wanna know is how many people died. I want some kind of, you know, back of the envelope, you know, guesstimate for how many people were killed during the plague because that demographic data is really crucial if you're going to try to understand what was the plague's impact on, on, you know, and whether or not what we're looking at are these localized, you know, traumatic, unquestionably, but, but localized disease events or something that impacted the entire empire overall. Um, and so I want to know that. But what I can tell you is if you count the bodies that the scientists have used, their samples number is 45. They have found 45 people who had plague. And by the way, they might not have died of plague. Remember our burials from Bavaria with the burial goods. Um, and I'll just say one thing. I don't know whether the scientists care if we get more bodies because the scientists aren't interested in bodies. They're interested in samples. What they want is to know more about the disease itself. They wanna know about specifically about the genetic history. Um, and just to kind of go back to, oh, I went off here. Hold on, let me try to find what I was looking for quickly. Here, this one. Um, so what they want to know is whether or not the this particular genome that they've been able to reconstruct in one place, how does it compare to the genome in another place? And can they find mutations? Um, can they find these, they're called, they look for things called SNPs, these single nucleotide polymorphisms, these little changes in the genetic code that suggest that they, and that suggest, that show that the, the, the bacteria is kind of changing. And for them, this is what they want to produce. So this looks to me as an historian, if I look at this, I think, oh, it's like a family tree. It's a, it's a dynastic succession, but no, it's called a clade. And what this is, this in a visual manner shows you genetic diversification, it shows you where you have connections between different uh, genomes and where you have genomes that are slightly different. Um, and one of the interesting kind of conclusions that Keller and et al. have, have come to in their big study from 2019 is that the, during the first pandemic, there actually was an extraordinary amount of mutations and diversification going on, way more so than the second and third, um, where there's relatively little. So what this means his, from an historian's point of view, I have no idea. Um, but but it's interesting. And, and perhaps one of the things they can tell us in the future is whether these mutations made our plague more or less virulent. That would be one thing they might be able to tell us. But whether or not our scientists have 45 bodies or 450,000 bodies, it's not exactly immaterial, but it's not, they're not gonna just start searching for bodies and do testing just to say yes or no, because that's not, I mean, they, they know how to do that already. That's not what they're interested in. So I think we have to, as historians, kind of be prepared for the fact that the scientists have in many ways different questions from us about the plague um, and that we may not ever get them to really answer our questions <laughs> and vice versa. Okay, I will leave it at that um, and stop sharing and see if people have questions. Okay, um, thank you. That was great. So we went from questions to questions and it looks like we already have a question in the chat. So um, I, I can read it to you because I know it's very, uh, it's a thank lot. You. I appreciate that. Juggle, um, when you're speaking and trying to keep up with that. Um, so does the present pandemic display any continuity of social behavior, ancient and present? Mm -hmm. And I guess the second part to the question, do you, um, do you have any 
do any resources of ecclesiastical use or misuse a plague to mobilize the population towards certain behavior or action? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's interesting question. Um, so I would say that the so back in March and April and, and May, when New York City was being really hit hard by um, COVID and you saw these mobile morgues and there were these images of these like of mass burials on some of these little islands off the coast of New York, like right off the coast of Manhattan, there are these little islands. And there's one, I should have included it for today. Um, it's not Governor's Island, but it's one of those little islands. Yeah. It's really stunning. I mean, it reminded me, to me, it very much resonated with what thing, things like what Procopius says when he talks about how Constantinople is overwhelmed by the number of bodies. Um, and in fact, one of the really interesting things that both Procopius and John of Ephesus tell us, and this is the first time in my knowledge this has ever happened, the, the emperor actually appointed a, a, an administrator to oversee burials, to oversee the burials precisely because it had reached this crisis point. And people were no longer able to, as you know, on a family unit, which is typically how burials are handled. Um, burials in this period were very much a family affair. Even the church wasn't that involved in it. Um, it was, so it's an extraordinary measure that the emperor himself would have stepped in and done that. Um, so I would say that, I mean, the other thing, you know, both Procopius and John of Ephesus, and Procopius is not, I mean, whether he was Christian or not is a huge debate, but he certainly is not an ecclesiastical writer. Um, John of Ephesus was, he was, a, he was a monk, he was a bishop. And when they both kind of parse the moral sort of frame of plague, they, they both actually say something super interesting. They both say that in certain cases, plague if for a short period of time brought out the best in people. People who were normally crappy um, became better. Um, people who were who normally you know didn't help out their fellow man help out their fellow man. But the minute the plague goes away, they all go back to being you know jerks again. And and I thought that was interesting because it it did sort of and this comes up I should say in like Gregory of Tours. I mean it's one of these things that people talk about quite a bit that like during the crisis, people are actually not so bad to each other. Um, so that was interesting. And but where you see the kind of use of the plague. Um, you do see it rhetorically used by church writers like John of Ephesus, like a vagaries of Antioch, like Gregory, um, as a way to sort of reflect on the kind of sinfulness of the community. Um, and, and in all these cases, you see a, a kind of emphasis on how while plague might bring out the best, it also in other cases can bring out the worst. And in fact, what Gregory and, and John of Ephesus also both talk about, despite being on different ends of the of the of the empire, um, is that is that plague didn't uh, that plague in some cases drove people to greed because they they saw these opportunities to take advantage of you know an abandoned house or you know an abandoned pot of gold or something and in particularly in John of Ephesus's story of the plague people, God punishes these people for for that kind of, for their avarice um, but but it's interesting in in that respect I mean so there's definitely a case where. Um, you know, as a, as a text, the text uses plague as a way to talk about morality and ethics and, and divine agency. Um, but I don't know of any cases where, um, as play, you know, in, in a kind of real time situation, as it were, that the um, that, that, sure, that clerics you or, or, you know, monastic you know, uh, officials used plague as a way to try to accomplish something. Um, I have seen this in other in other disaster contexts, but not not in plague. In war, I, I would argue it actually does happen, but I have not seen it in plague. Great, thank you. I think um, the next question is to what extent is the threat of archeological and scientific plague maximalism determinism a result of a larger problem with late Roman historiography and the broader problematic framing of the decline and fall? <laughs> Yes, <laughs> I mean, I would say without question that this is a, um, 
Yeah, I mean, this is actually in many ways what's kind of motivating this project because I, as a, as a historian of late antiquity, I mean, it's really interesting. It's like either my entire period is about catastrophe and collapse or like you would think nothing bad ever happened. Um, you know, happy monks and, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, the birth of Christianity and all of that. And so it's this, it's a kind of almost like schizophrenia in a very misuse of that trade. You know, what, you know, sort of two different ways of thinking about it. And, and again, it comes down to this debate between the people we call the continuists and the people we call the catastrophists. And I'm just sick of that debate. I'm just sick of that, that, that polarity. I, I don't actually think it gets us anywhere. And I think what no one's really done is say, well, you know, like what does disaster mean to these people? Like both in a, in a cultural way, but also in a material way. What, how do people respond socially and, and, and economically? Um, and I think we can actually answer some of these questions better than we thought we could if we, if we look carefully at our evidence and don't just keep coming from one or the other and really try to think about new ways. And I'm, I'm really interested in thinking about these questions on a level of scale, how you know, something could be um, benign on one level, but but totally traumatic on another, and and that and that people might not be aware of these different scales, and 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 so I think it's important to um, yes to to think about this in terms of this larger historiographical problem um, that's that very much still defines my field. So yes, thank you. <laughs> Okay, great. Um, a third question is Procopius mentions that doctors who tend to patients rarely contracted the disease. Has any work been done on that or is it just an unexplained comment? Um, it's been, it's a good question. I can't think of anyone, if any study that I've specifically seen on that, except to say that you know, bubonic, unlike this, so the pneumonic form can be passed through air droplets. And so, you know, like COVID can be. Um, and so it is possible, and, and I know that like Kyle Harper has hypothesized about this, that, that when you had a Yersinia pestis event, people might, their primary infection might be bubonic, but they could end up having like a secondary Pneumonic, um, and so you know, so it's therefore it is possible that sometimes very close contact with people could make you sick. But I would think that most of the time it wouldn't, right? Because you still need the flea, you still need that ectoparasite to go from one place to another. And you know, probably you know, did did any doctor get sick? I mean, certainly you know, of course they did. And 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 I think Procopius is is trying to basically in many ways, make a larger point about the randomness of plague. I mean, that's another theme of, of his um, of his account. Like, some people get it, some people don't. Some people leave, some people stay. Some people, you know, there's no, there's no real pattern in his mind, um, which is something that throws him. But it's, it's also ties up to his kind of sort of cosmological way of thinking, which is to see the world as governed by fate. And 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 the kind of you know how the the you know, the inscrutability of that in many ways, um, so so I don't think so. But I mean I think you could certainly think about this again as a disease that probably wasn't as easy to pass as other forms of diseases that are passed through say air droplets, you know, breathing on somebody. And it's a good question. Hmm. Yeah, interesting to think about in the contemporary context. Yeah, yeah, the kind of larger epidemiological context of it is is interesting for sure. Yeah. Okay. So um, another question from Kay is: Could you talk a little bit more about the new thinking regarding origins? The eliminate, you know, name you mentioned the elimination of the Asian origin, um, and could there have been a Could there have been reservoirs in the Mediterranean world that were triggered in some way? Yeah, I found that interesting too. Yeah, so, so the, the 2019 Keller at Al study could not find any genetic basis to mm -hmm. link the, the, the genomes they had reconstructed with genomes that had been reconstructed from Central Asia. Um, so that was, you know, their kind of saying, look, I, you know, may, and, and which is not an absolute no, it's just what they looked at doesn't seem to, to be connected back. So, so, but I think your question is a good one. Like, should we, 
in fact, go back to your Europe, really, what we call Europe today, um, you know, and think about and 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 you know the Levant and North Africa, and think about um, these pre-existing reservoirs, these rodent reservoirs, which we know, you know, almost certainly existed. In fact. Um, there's a big school of thought, I think I mentioned, that the second and third pandemic are actually the same pandemic, that the plague never goes away in the 18th century to come back in the 19th. It's actually was always there um, living in these, these rodent reservoirs. So, um, so that's a really good question. And, and I think people are looking at it. And the volcano thing is super interesting. The person whose work I would point you to who has looked at this kind of question, these links between um, other environmental events um, like volcanic eruptions, which of course can, can have climatic impacts, as we know, um, is a guy named Tim Newfield. Um, and he teaches in Georgetown. And he is a um, he is an historian of infectious disease who also looks a lot at the connections with environmental factors. Um, and Tim's work is amazing. So I would definitely um, look up him. And he actually has a whole article that's called like, I forget what it's called, but it has volcano in the title. And it's specifically looking at this link between disease outbreak and volcanic eruptions. And, and I would definitely, and I will um, be happy if you if you email me, Catherine, I'd be more than happy to, to send you the, that specific um, uh, 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 reference. Great, okay. And I think we'll fit in um, this last question and then also allow you uh, a minute because I know you wanted to share the bibliography in the chat. Yes, thank you. Um, so I'll go ahead and ask you, um, do you have any thoughts on the purported demographic devastation of the plague in Constantinople's surprising ability to continue to wage significant and costly wars? Yes, I mean, this has often been, um, you know, raised as, again, one of these questions like how, um, you know, so the so 541 is at the time in 541 the the Roman Empire is fighting wars on two fronts. It's fighting a war in Italy against the Ostrogoths and it's fighting a war um, intermittently against the Persians. And so you have so that's obviously very expensive and um, how you know, how could you continue to fight these wars on two fronts and simultaneously be destroyed economically? And that is very much one of those questions that people have long raised. Um, you know, one response that I once got when I posed this to a friend of mine who's not a, a, a late Romanist but is an environmental historian of of the early modern period, and he and I said, well, you know, how could you how could how could you do that? And he said, well, you know, look. Look, look at the 14th century, you know, it was the, the Hundred Years War and, and yet they still fought that and there was and there was the Black Death. So I'm not, you know, I, I think I think it does raise questions. And I would say too, then that there's been that, that Mordecai and Eisenberg and then the other Mordecai at all article go through other types of evidence that has been used before to argue that there was some kind of, that this had some kind of serious impact on the Justinianic regime. Um, for example, people used to argue that after 541, Justinian ceased issuing legislation um, because everything was just so awful. And the only legislation he, he, you know, one of the few pieces of legislation that he does issue is actually a, a, a command for um, freezing wages. Because, right, one of the things that, that sometimes happens after a big demographic event like a die off is wages actually go up because there are fewer people around to compete for, for his jobs. Um, and what, what they show, Mordecai et al., is that if you actually if you actually sort of lay out all the legislation for annual resolution, there is no drop off in 541. In fact, the, the, de the decrease in legislation, which there is, happens in like 539. So it's, it's again, you can't tie it that carefully. And then the numismatic evidence, which I didn't even bring up because I think it's, they pretty much have put it to bed. Um, people used to argue that there was this drop off in coin production, that there was also a diminishing, a diminishment of the ratio between gold and bronze. And I think they've shown that that's also 
just not true. <laughs> um, and, and so, yes, so I would definitely um, think that it would be very hard to understand how that war could have, those, those wars could have been carried out, um, which isn't to say Justinian had a lot of money. I mean, he was constantly in, pro in trouble financially, but I don't think the plague um, ha certainly had no long-term impact on that. Great. Well, thank you. And I know um, Eva Van Dessa has included another comment and um, noting a similarity with an earlier um, period. Um, but we are at 501. So I don't, uh, I do want to wrap it up. Yeah, um, let me let me get uh, sorry, let me figure out how to do this. Well, I've never done this before. So let me I think um, if you could just paste a link. Um, ah, okay, I can do that. Hold on. Oh, nope, I didn't mean to do that. And also a reminder, because I know we are wrapping it up, but um, there is the workshop tomorrow. Um, so another opportunity to continue uh, discussing disaster and late antiques. Yes. Okay, Where, here we go. Okay, so. If it's a Word document though, how would I do that? Sorry, I should have known this. Does anyone know if it's a Word document? Um, you could do, if you put it in Google Docs, you could probably get the link. We can also try to follow up um, on our listserv, which um, might, because you know, okay. chat goes away once we close the meeting. So it also is a little- yeah. I'm so sorry. I feel like I should know how to do this and I don't. Um, I thought there was gonna be a simple like choice yeah sure. okay um let no, me just... we would be happy to share it too if you want us to sure why don't i um email it to you all and then you can share it to everybody and i apologize for that um but if anybody ha yeah so so sorry no no it's all right i mean we have um uh, can you put in the a lot of things surprise there's not an easy way to do this though is there a way to put on an, att an attachment? That's what I'm looking for. Where it says file at the bottom of the chat. I don't know what that is. Oh, but... hold on. Let me see. File at the bottom of the chat. I don't have sure. a file. Yeah, it, it's for the Google Drive. Um, oh. Uh, okay, which I don't have. Um, yeah. Okay, I will just send this to you so you all don't have to sit here and kind of watch me pathetically flail here. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. The presentation worked wonderfully and you know, I think it went really well. We, we didn't have a lot of the connections sort of slowing and, and the sometimes, Good. and it was a really wonderful talk. So thank you for sharing right. that with us. Well, thank uh, you for having me and thank you for your great questions. And um, I will, um be happy to again i'll send out the bibliography for everybody great thank you, you so much tomorrow. okay bye all right everyone have a good rest thank of your you. evening bye bye